Good morning. morning. Welcome to each and everyone here in the sanctuary or at home on this Palm Sunday. Um, In looking ahead, some of the announcements, it's in the bulletin. Um, Our Zoom prayer meeting will be held Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. The M&M meeting will be held this Thursday, and I think they really need, if you're coming, please sign up in the office or let them know in one way or the other that you are coming. Lunch will be served at 12 noon, and again, if you're planning to attend, please let them know. Love Feast will be held also on Thursday at 7. Please join in this evening of worship. And next Sunday, Easter Sunday, Easter sunrise service will be held here at 7. It will be outdoors, so please bring your own chairs. There will be light refreshments after the service. And of course, regular worship will be at 1030. Newsletter deadline is next Sunday, so please submit any articles to the office. Pretzel barrel. We have $77 so far toward our challenge of $350. It's in the Northex now and will be there for our contributions each Sunday, and we have until May the 1st to reach this $350. Our congregation has 21 walkers in the crop walk, which is to be held on April the 24th. Their names are on the bulletin board, and you have just two weeks left to support a walker in the fight to end hunger one step at a time. And again, tickets will be available for the mother, daughter, friends tea, which is planned for May 14th. They are on sale out in the Narthex after worship and will be for the next few Sundays. Please let Jolinda know if you have any of the items that they would like to borrow, such as the tea stands, teapots, sugar creamers, um, and she needs to know as soon as possible so they can make their plans, if you have any of those that that can be loaned to them for this. Um, Be sure to read your bulletin for uh, there are other articles and for details about some of these. So now let us quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare for worship by listening to the prelude. Would you stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship? Come from the city streets. Come from your busy homes and places of business. 
Come, lay down your sorrows and your worries. Let us all join in joyful song. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is Jesus Christ, who comes in God's name. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, on the first Palm Sunday, you entered the rebellious city where you were to die. Enter our hearts, we pray, and subdue them to yourself. And as our disciples blessed your coming and spread garments and branches in your way, make us ready to lay at your feet all that we have and are, that we too may bless your coming. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Now let us join together and sing hymn 258, Man of Sorrows. come to the time of our prayer, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Gracious God, we arrive here this Sunday on this holiest of weeks. We think of the great pomp and circumstance that you arrived in this great city. People chanting your name, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Then you had a meal with your disciples. Then you were betrayed. You were tried and hung from a cross. All in just a couple of days. God, bring us in to this week. Bring us into this movement. Bring us in to your will. Lord, there is so much going on in the world. We pray again for your assistance in the war in Ukraine and the suffering and war. Take control of it, O oh God. Be with us here. Nourish us. Comfort us. Provide for us, O oh Lord. We have many who want to be lifted up in prayer this day. From Sue Allball and Shirley Altivator, Ruth Ackerman. Bill and Casey Caputo, Tony Clark, Melissa and Rick Green, Byron and Jenny Grossnickel, Donna Healy, Joe Hughes, Thurston Myers, Janet Reister, Donnie Smith, who also brought up the joy of how many cards and well wishes he received and thanking the congregation for that. Elizabeth Snyder and Donna Snyder, excuse me, Elizabeth Snyder and Donna Steiner, Mike Straub, Lyle and June Stutzman, Ruth Thomas, Barbara Lynn Warthen, Sharon Weeks, 
Paul Awaivo and Dates Zep. Lord, we also want to pray for everyone out there who needs prayer, who has gone forward without asking. God, you know our hearts. Answer our prayers even when we do not ask you, O Lord. We call out to you for that. Be with us. Nurture us. Always. We pray this day the way your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But to lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would now like to deviate from our uh, bulletin today and invite up Rhonda to do our children's moment first. You can you can sit or we can, we're going to stand in a minute. Oh, geez, you didn't tell me that. They didn't they didn't know we were going to exercise while we're up here. You may wonder why I'm dressed in this fashion. No, maybe not. But is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So you know today is one of the best days of the year. Thank you, Jesus for everything you did for us. So I got to say that first. So anybody who comes in, you know, when you're young and all, you want to be real pretty on Easter, come on in, have a seat. Yay. She's so excited. Isn't it great? All right. This is awesome. Isn't it great? I know. Okay. So we come into church, and we go around doing our job, and we look a certain way sometimes. We could be like a football player, like this. Yeah. <laughs> we could be like a football player, or... <laughs> okay, hold on. Next, next thing. Oh, I didn't know you had some... I got more stuff. Or, my hair all up in the air. We could be a cook, you know, working like really hard, or a baker. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doer now. Yep. Next. Next thing. We'll just leave that as it is for a minute. We could be a baseball player. Okay. Anybody have rotten tomatoes? They can throw them out. It's okay because I can catch them. Okay. Okay, you might, you might walk around, you might be a gardener, you can plant seeds. Do you like that? Yeah. That's awesome. Anybody can plant seeds. You can pull weeds too. These are great for pulling weeds. You could be a hunter. All hunters wear orange hats. Okay. Okay. All right, or an orange vest. Or, like some people in this world, you might be cold, you might be lonely, and this might be the only thing you have is a nice blanket. This is kind of like what Jesus wraps us in. Okay? He wraps us in his warmth. Okay, y'all got to stand up now. <clears throat> okay? So see how we all are different up here? We're all different. We all have on different things. We all have on different clothes. We don't dress the same. We all have different hair. Mine is a good box. It's a good color job. <laughs> Yours is brown. Yes. What do you do? 
um, I go see my hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean like that. I mean like you ask a simple question. Okay. Oh, what are you looking for? <laughs> How would we know that you are Sandy by your job, by your name, or what you wear? My personality. <laughs> Good answer. And what about Carol? How would we know that this is Carol? My hands. Everybody says my big head. See, because wh what do you do? Everybody knows what I do. What they didn't know. Is I'm a dairy farmer. See, Every a farmer <laughs> and a grandma. And what about yes. Donna? How would we know you're Donna? I think um, because I foster dogs, I think that's now my my identity. Yeah. All right. <laughs> See, she fosters dogs. And what about Michael? How will we know this is Michael? Uh, from playing baseball and playing football. He's very talented. He does multiple things. And what about Wayne? Well, I'm retired and loving it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Sandy? I guess different people see different things. That is true. <laughs> Depending on who looks at you, they see different things. And what about you? How do we know you're Liana? Because I love my family. Aww. Oh my gosh, my heart just melted a thousand times. <laughs> so, she just stole the whole show. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yay! Okay, so because we are all wrapped in this wonderful love of Jesus. Yeah, that's right, and that's the next thing. Because it doesn't matter if we're a football player or a grandma or a dairy farmer or sports or a dog handle, anything that's up here, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if you're a baker. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like. Jesus loves us all because all he wants us to do is show our love in our big old heart up here. If we show our love, we all are the same. He loves us all the same. He died for us so that his love would show and we could be love. We could be love and we could show love and we could have a bigger heart than even this. So thank you all for volunteering <laughs> for my crazy thing. And I just want to have a real quick prayer. Dear Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Every day when I wake up and I can see and I can hear and I can do and I can love, on others, and just bless somebody. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for showing the love that you have for us. And may we go out in peace and go out and show all kinds of love to everyone. Amen. We don't want to choke while we're singing. I'll just put it up here. Thank you so much. I'd like to now invite up our choir for their anthem. All of them that aren't already up here. <laughs>
All right. How is everyone this Sunday? <clears throat> our first reading and our continuation of our sermon series this Sunday from John 19, verse 30. It is finished. Continuing on to Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not by will, but by yours, let it be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. He asked, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. God bless the reading and now the proclamation of this word. I'd like to start today with a very brief admission. <clears throat> when I start preparing for Palm Sunday every year, I think to myself, what am I supposed to even be talking about here this Sunday? I find this one of the most difficult Sundays to prepare for. What are you supposed to talk about? You might be out there saying, well, it's Palm Sunday. Talk about the palms. Talk about the great triumph of an entry. Talk about people chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But then we skip to next Sunday, and spoiler alert, we're going to talk about the risen Christ. There's a lot that happens between Hosanna in the highest on Palm Sunday and the risen Christ the following Sunday. There's the Last Supper. There's the betrayal. We have the Garden at Gethsemane. We have the trial. We have the conviction. We have the crucifixion. And we're supposed to squeeze it all into this narrow little week. Well, this week... Since we are already spending so much time on the cross, and we're in the middle of a seven-part sermon series, we're going to continue there for now. There's a couple of significant things that are going on here right before we get where we are. Our scripture passage this Sunday is from the Garden of Gethsemane. Where does that occur, right? This is after Christ has been betrayed but before the soldiers have come. The Last Supper is over, and Jesus goes to the garden. He tells the couple of disciples with him, pray that you don't fall in temptation. Pray, pray, pray. And then we get this moment, this moment of Jesus in anguish, this moment of Jesus suffering, this moment of Jesus praying out to God. And by the end of it, he looks up and looks back at the disciples, the ones that he gave orders to, and they're all just asleep. They're exhausted, they're worn out, they're done. Not one of them stayed up with him. Just a few moments before, Jesus predicted his betrayal, and every last one of them, in anguish at the thought of the betrayal, asked Jesus, Lord, is it I? Not seemingly convinced that they weren't the ones that were about to betray Jesus. And yet a couple of hours later, when he asked them to stay up with him, they all fall asleep. They're all not present. They're all done. After the Last Supper, we have this love feast, and then Jesus went out onto the Mount of Olives, the Garden at Gethsemane. All of his disciples fall asleep and fail to follow his instructions. But that's not really the part of the passage that gets to me. I've got to say, this has always been, for me, one of the most hard-hitting passages in the Bible. 
one that I struggle with. It gets emotional for me. I, I almost tear up reading it. When Jesus prays, he asks, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I think as a church, as a people of God, sometimes we diminish the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Because after all, it is the divine taking up the cross. It is the Son of God. Of course he can do it. We know he can do it. Sure, we call out and glorify Jesus for the salvation provided, the grace provided, for the incredible love that digs so deep as to see Jesus taking up a cross and dying for all of us. But listen to these words. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not by my will, but by yours. Jesus doesn't seem to want to take up the cross. This is the one spot we really see it biblically. Jesus knows he's about to go through anguish and torment. It's going to be awful. And he asks God to do something about it. Imagine these words a little different. Let's, let's make them cut a little deeper. Dad, Daddy, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to be tortured. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be tormented. I don't want to die. Imagine those of you that are parents. Imagine your child asking you this, to take this pain away. Mom, Mommy, take the pain away. Imagine those of you that have a parent that you have become the guardian for, wanting to be made okay, just wanting you to take care of them, to hold them in your arms. This passage breaks your heart. Mom, don't make me go through this. Dad, I don't think I can do it. But Jesus says then, but your will be done. If I must, I must. The love for this world, for God, for all of the others are so great that knowing what he is about to go through, Jesus still does it. When Christ said to the disciples, pray so that you don't fall into temptation, how much was this Christ praying that he didn't fall into temptation? Because Christ did not want to do this. That he could, <clears throat> he didn't know, he didn't seem to understand if he still had the strength to do what had to be done. Could he take on all of this brutality in order to save this world? So I want to take a second to transition back to our passage this week. Back to the cross. Beginning right where we left off last week's scripture. Later, knowing that everything had been now finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was placed on a sponge and given to him on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and, he lift, and it was lifted to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I wonder what you think of when you hear that last line. It is finished. It's over. I mean, read as written, as we understand it in English, it seems to say it's over. I am about to die, and then Jesus dies. But the Greek word here, te teleste, carries with it a little bit of a different gloss. And it's something I don't think we often notice in our bi biblical readings. It is finished is an appropriate translation, but in connecting glosses and context, it is completed is a more accurate translation. It is not that Christ's life is over. 
It is that the last fulfillment of Scripture in being given the vinegar to drink at its end has been fulfilled. What we sometimes miss in this is that this is a word of completion and a word typically used for success, as in mission completed. Christ has completed the mission. The gloss on this final line, it is finished. It is, some, it is completed. It is one that carries a term of success, of triumph. Christ is proclaiming he has done it. He has done the thing that he didn't want to have to do. That the mission is completed, and in this context, and of the other passage we read, he didn't want to suffer, but he did. He was successful, he completed the mission. I wonder, has anyone out there, I know most of the time when I ask you anything about a Greek term, you all look at me like I'm kind of crazy, but have, have, has anybody out here ever encountered this word, te teleste, before? Anybody? I wonder if any bankers or accountants have ever encountered this word before. Not that they can say. They have the confused look on their face as well. <clears throat> it was famously used in another way historically. It was an accounting term. The term was stamped on a bill. Te teleste was stamped on a bill to say paid in full. We have read the wages of our sin is death, and here now the debt has been paid once and for always. Our sin is paid for, our unworthiness is purchased, our bill has been pardoned. Jesus proclaims at the end of his time on the cross, it is finished, it is paid in full, Jesus has paid the blood, Christ, the blood price for the sins of all humanity before and after. We are saved by this blood of Christ. Let me ask you a question today. What are your burdens? What is weighing you down? Where does it feel empty? The greatest debt we should owe, Jesus has already paid. On the cross, Jesus declares victory over sin and victory over death in his dying breath, proclaiming, I have done it, it is finished, it is paid in full. As hard as it gets, as bad as it gets, as much as we may want to give up, we have a blessed assurance that in the end, Christ wins. In the face of certain death that was rapidly approaching, our Messiah proclaims victory. That the work of the Messiah was completed, but our journey does not stop there. Some of you know I'm a big fan of the theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer, so here's my opportunity to read part of his work again. In Diedrich Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship, he says, Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a person must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a person their life, and it is grace because it is it gives a person the only true life that matters. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace, and gives grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. We were bought at a price. And what he cost, and what has cost God much, cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our lives, but delivered him up for us. 
Costly grace is the incarnation of God. The cost of our debt sometimes seems like a cheap one to all of us, but it was not. An innocent man and son of our God had to be sacrificed to bear our burdens. As we move through this Holy Week, I invite you to consider the cost that was paid for your debt. I encourage you to consider our grace and our freedom from the cost of sin. And I invite you to ask, what will you do with this grace? Will you go on living the way you did before you understood the sacrifice? Or will you be transformed by the love of Christ? Will you pick up your own cross? Count well the cost of this transaction. Gracious God, blessed Savior, how can we ever repay the debt that we owe? The cost of the debt that you wiped clean. To you, Lord God, we give our, all of our honor, all of our praise, and proclaim, worthy is the Lamb, always and forever. Amen. God, thank you for being with us in this wandering moment where we stand poised between life and death, filled to the brim with sorrow, filled with thoughts of what has been and what lies before us. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for our friend Jesus, who was a gift to the world, a gift in each of our lives. Comfort us even as we are shaken by the horror of these last hours. Be our friend in this time of sorrow and sustain us in the days to come. Now, may God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and give you eternal peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.